Hello and welcome to The Arise interview. 60 minutes of big questions about the big stories from the news and beyond with fresh insight and critical analysis. I'm Charles Anyagolo. Coming up in the next hour, the phenomenon of corruption is well known in Nigeria and beyond and is nothing new. But what is attracting considerable attention is the demand for accountability and the women's voices that are leading the anti-corruption charge in Nigeria. These women are making a connection between gender and accountability in the fight against graft, which they say disproportionately affects women and girls in Nigeria. We'll talk to those in the front line as we attempt to understand the link between corruption and gender equality issues in a moment. Now, if someone walked up and put it to you that the Nigerian professions, the upper classes, the politicians are all thoroughly corrupt, I suspect it probably wouldn't create much of a sensation. In today's world, news of corruption among the good and the great is almost daily breakfast reading. But whereas many of us are inclined to shrug and regard it as an unfortunate factor of life, a group of women from various NGOs have set themselves the task of discovering the nature and extent of such corruption, particularly where the practice affects women and girls, who they argue make up a disproportionate number of the poor and the needy. We'll talk about the impact of corruption on the female gender in particular in a moment. But first, here's the former Nigerian Minister of Finance, Ngozi okonjo Iweala, who tried to battle corruption in Nigeria, talking about its impact on society. So firstly, speaking for my continent, for my country, and even for other countries globally, we have to admit that in most cases, corruption is a problem. It's not tagged to a particular set of people. We all know, whether we're here in the UK, the US, Nigeria, other African countries, that this exists in one form or the other. And the issue is the set of laws and the will we have to fight it. But speaking for my country, yes, we have to say yes, that we have problems and that corruption undermines development in Nigeria, on the continent. It deprives us from resources with which we can fight poverty and create wealth for people. When a civil servant demands under the table money for a service that they should deliver, they diminish the service and they diminish the people they serve. This is corruption. When a teacher demands sexual favors to give a student high marks in an exam or to pass them, they diminish the student. They diminish themselves. They undermine education. They undermine development. This is corruption. A Nigerian Minister of Finance there, who was also the former Managing Director of the World Bank, Ngozi okonjo -Iwele. Well, for more on the impact of corruption on women and girls and the Accountability Initiative, I'm joined now in the studio by Lois Chinedu, who's a Programme Officer of the Nigerian Women's Trust Fund and the Gender and Accountability Project, and by Zainab Abdul Rashid, who is the Executive Program Officer for Women's Rights Advancement and Protection Alternative, and is also part of the Gender and Accountability Project. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me start with you, Lois. Um, what exactly is the meaning of gender and accountability? What's at the heart of it? Okay, so you see, um, gender refers to the social attributes that is being associated to men and women. So the social roles they play, that's what we talk about when we talk about gender. And accountability has to do with using resources or the power that is given to you to do exactly what you're required to do with it. And then when you have done that, you are able to tell the citizens who have given you the power to use this to work that this is the power you've given to me and this is what I've been able to use it to do. 
that's accountability in simple terms. Well, I understand the definition of the word gender and accountability. Yeah. I'm trying to find the link between the two and why we're actually here talking about it. So um, the thing is that normally when you talk about accountability, corruption, anti-corruption, people do not understand that um, it has its own gender implications. And for us at Women Fund, we've noticed that when we talk about corruption issues, you mm. hear a lot of men talk about it, the way it affects them. You see them out there. Mm. But for us, we keep, we keep asking, why is it that majority of the people who it affects even more than directly, indirectly, are not raising up their voices? Why are we not hearing it, anything about you know, these issues from such groups of people? And then what can they do? And the resulting effect is because they do not even, a lot of them do not know their rights, especially when you look at the indirect effect of corruption and how it affects women. For example, I'll give the example of uh, school building or someone who has been given the contract to construct you know, a school building and then offer proper sanitary conditions. Mm. If the money is given for that you know, particular activity. It's not utilized to its full purpose. What it means is that if the project is done halfway and then the sanitary condition is not conducive enough, indirectly it will affect especially the female children. The same reason why you have a lot of female children staying back away from school when they're on their periods. The reason is simply because the sanitary conditions in the school is not conducive. So for us, we say when we talk about anti-corruption, we talk about corruption, we are saying that the people who are involved, the gender implications of how this problem affects this group of people should come into play. So if you would address the issue on just one end, the other end who suffers may not even know what you're doing. So when you provide services and then it's just general, mm. without the gender dimensions being considered, it means that the people who should benefit from these services will not benefit from it. And they will not also know the right channels to go to when they are not benefiting. They will not also know that they need to raise their voices to demand for accountability in these issues because simply they do not know. So we are saying for policies, for legislation, whatever it is, there are a group of people who this problem affects but are not out there. And these are the people that we are saying we need to bring right. into the table. Okay, let me bring you in, Zainab, because, I mean, it sounds like we're dissecting a problem that is clearly a universal problem across Nigeria. I mean, I, I suppose it is fair to describe you as experts in the field of gender and accountability, because, I mean, Lois is just talking very... Um, intelligently about it just a minute ago. I mean, how exactly are you strengthening leadership and accountability in this area? Because it's very difficult to convince people that there is a special focus in this on gender. I mean, corruption affects everybody in Nigeria. I mean, if the light goes bad in this building, it affects me, it affects you. That's true. At Ruakba which is a women's rights advancement and protection alternative, our main focus is women's rights. Right. So for that institutional advantage, we have come up with a program, which is the Gender and Accountability Project, where we're um, coordinating seven other cohort members on the fight against corruption and in the gender perspective. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with fighting corruption, yes. but it's to say, gender. well, we're a little bit special, <laughs> therefore we have a special sort of yeah. fight. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I, I'm trying to get you to convince me that that is a reason, not just the broad sort of general thing about fighting corruption because it's bad for society, mm -hmm. but we need to fight corruption and make people more accountable because of how it affects women and girls. Yeah, because women are always at the receiving end of whatever social um, facilities are available mm. in general societal spheres, be it education, health, politics. Women get the trickles of the um, um, corruption or inaccountability of the, the stakeholders who are meant to deliver those amenities to the In masses. other words, they suffer the most they suffer from the, the consequences, qu consequences of, of the corrupt of practices. Yes. Right. So we are out here to make people know their rights because knowing the rights of uh, uh, being a woman and knowing your rights is right. one. And then how to go about demanding accountability from duty bearers, be they um, um, hospital workers and all that is another. So in this 
aspects we have identified various other CSOs and NGOs to work with in various states aco across right. Nigeria to make sure women's voices are amplified to demand their rights since they are the ones getting the impact of the corrupt environment that we currently have. Well, as I said, everyone yes. feels the impact. Yes. I mean, it's not just you, but the I promise women you. Are but, most but, hate. but I understand <laughs> the point you're making. Let me bring you in, Lois, because there, there is a, an important message in what you're saying, mm -hmm. which is essentially that because women tend to be less financially able on their own, mm -hmm. given the traditions and the strictures of Nigerian society, that they tend to be more dependent on public transport, mm -hmm. for example, on hospitals. Mm -hmm. I mean, they may be left with their mm -hmm. children and so on and so forth, and they need that kind of public assistance. And therefore, when corruption affects those institutions, mm -hmm. it directly affects women. Does that, is that, yeah. in, in a sense, what you're saying? Yes, in a sense, that's what, we, what I'm saying. And right. In another way, what we've been doing under the Gender and Accountability Project is not just, you know, raising the voices, but we're actually getting women to demand. So, for example, I would use um, the states we work in. We have a project going on in Kano and Oyo, and what we did prior to the elections was to say, it's not enough for us to come out to tell people that um, women are disproportionately affected. Mm. A lot of people do not understand, so we needed evidence. And so we got a group of people, trained them on campaign finance tracking. We sent them out to the field and said, for the period before the 2019 elections, go to the field and then get back information for us as regards the number of women who are contesting for okay. elections. I, I'm, I'm just, and you were talking before we went on a break. Yes. You were telling us about what your people were doing, going out into the field to gather information and all mm -hmm. of that during the election period. Yes. And um, like I was saying, we went into the field and then people got back to us saying there were a number of women who were trying to contest election as of that period. But in terms of the campaign finance that was spent, the women were all trying to fall within the Electoral Act. The amount of money that was said should mm. be spent, they were all within the range. But you find out that they were you know, contesting elections with people who had more resources and we are deliberately flaunting the Electoral Act, and it was not a problem. So for us, we kept asking the question of how are these women to cope in terms of you know, campaigning against the men who had all of the resources. And the truth be told, there was a particular state where you had a particular candidate campaigning with funds based on calculations that were over a billion naira. Mm. That was far above what the Electoral Act said of 100 million naira for those contesting for you know, governorship elections. So for us, we were like, this is a challenge for women, but we couldn't stop at that. And so the onion fell on us to say, if we can't get it right here, we need to also ensure that when whoever wins this election gets elected, they need to also be held accountable to the promises that they have made. Mm. And so right now, we have also gone back to the field to say, collect the campaign promises that were made. And now we are now in this state ensuring that the promises made to the people are being kept. Mm. And so far we have tracked the ones that are being kept and the ones that are hanging. And what we've been doing with the and, radio and which stations, one predominates over exactly. the other? I expect the... E exactly. Well, and, and, and you conclude. know, we, we, we decided to ensure that this time around we will focus on promises that also ultimately, you know, would present more benefits for women. Mm. And what we do is when a promise is being said and it's not being completely fulfilled, we take it up at the radio station to say, the governor made this promise when he was campaigning. Halfway is gone, but now we need him to complete this. The reason is because prior to now, women will just hear this thing's being said, possibly use that to vote, and then that's it. Mm. Nobody is insisting that you made us this promise, you need to keep it. And I think CEDOC is working in Enugu. Mm -hmm. CEDOC is getting community women to demand for their rights. They have demanded for, you know, transformers that were promised and were not given, and right now they have it. These are things that before now, women were not really sure of. They didn't know what to do. So for us, it's a step in the right direction. Right. So, we so are that falls into the, of the course, ambit of, of accountability, course, of course, basically. Of course. Uh, that, that's a very important point you're making. I do have to point out, though, mm -hmm. that it's not just women who feel oppressed by the guys who spend a hundred billion naira. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I went into the elections, I wouldn't have a hundred billion naira, and I'd <laughs> feel just as deprived as any woman. But let me ask you this, um, Zainab. 
um, because Lois was talking about concrete things that, that you were doing and that you were achieving. What would you say that your intervention has achieved briefly um, since you began to amplify issues of gender and accountability? Yeah, the basic focus of this project is actually making women aware after which they now are able to amplify their voices mm -hmm. by the major in intervention of our project. And so, so far, in various states, like I said before, we have various partners who are into um, um, sensitization, right. mobilization of women at the grassroots level, um, training on various uh, monitoring um, um, strategies for demanding accountability, both in budget uh, locations and the rest. And like Lois said, in Enugu, in Zamfara, health-wise, the, the women are able to demand accountability at the grassroots level. In fact, the men have been even trying to champion the demand for accountability mm -hmm. in the health sector in Zamfara State, which is, which is even not the norm being a northern state because the, the women are rather to be heard, um, to be, rather to be heard so than to be seen. Right. So, but now they are, their husbands are in charge asking the duty bearers in the health sectors to please allow their women have access to all the facilities they should and which of course will in turn give them the, the opportunity to be a bit more buoyant because well they are meant to get free of charge when it's um, siphoned the woman goes home with nothing and her health or child's health is al also a stake for this so those are um, tidbits of what is going on and then in the communications aspect we're utilizing traditional and me, um, social media uh, interventions like um, the WFM Women's Radio in Lagos and Abikuta. Uh, they're championing the cause of amplifying women's voices by bringing up discourses that are targeted at the gender and accountability um, discourse, making women speak up. Right, but, but of course, ultimately, yes. I mean, you, you want to reach the decision makers because yeah. they're the ones who, are, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter whether you're talking to your husbands or, your, yeah. you know, I mean, it's the people who make decisions yeah. that you really want to get to. Yes. And is the Nigerian government taking your advice and your suggestions on board? If so, to what extent are they doing that? Yeah. Um, on the project, recently, um, WFM was part of the the... Um, sex for grades release that right, okay, the BBC right. yeah. and um, an awful scandal really yes and um, to that effect we had uh, there was a public hearing recently on the um, bill for bill on sexual harassment in tertiary institutions where we had our input sent mm. in as a concerned NGO that is focusing greatly on the rights of women in all spheres, whether sexual, um, in public and social spaces or private spaces, to, uh, so to speak. So, so far, we had our own input to that um, hearing and hopefully, because we also major on the aspect of legislative advocacy mm. and this Which public hearing, yes, course, yes, because if um, the government being a, the, the major stakeholder mm. and um, should be accountable to the citizens, and in this case, women who we are focusing on to help demand their rights, go the, the length to pass such um, bills that would enhance women's rights, mm. I think women will be better for it. And so we always put in our best to see that advocacy is taken to the next level in all spheres of whatever projects we're um, implementing. So such interventions come in handy when we get um, women sensi sensitized to know their rights and how to go about demanding mm. them and holding duty bearers accountable to be able to implement such, um, like the VAP Act, the Violence Against Persons um, Prohibition Bill. It's been passed, but not fully implemented. Okay, let me ask you this. Is there a means by which the issue of gender equality is monitored in Nigeria or issues that affect gender equality? Yes. There are a lot of issues in different spheres of society today in Nigeria that affect mm. um, 
women dispo um, proportionately, one of which is politically. It's so glaring that men have most of the um, offices in the political sphere. And um, to this effect, the 35% uh, affirmative action that has been clamored for is still what is on ground for so long, which mm. women are still agitating for. And, um, and of course, the problem is that yeah. the rights are not something that are natural yeah. to society. They're things you wrest from the domain of control. So mm -hmm. you have to go out there yeah. and demand your rights, yeah. which is pretty much what you're doing. Yes. And this is because cultural and um, traditional mm. norms have overpowered the, you know, the normal human women's rights that should be um, used in every normal society across Nigeria. And this is why we are always trying to see how women are mobilized from every strata of society to mm. see that they are sensitized, first of all, to know what their rights are in specific areas of society and then be able to demand for it. Right. Okay, well, let, let me ask you this, Lois, because this is a fundamental question and is essential mm -hmm. for the audience out there to understand what you're doing. How would you say corruption affects women and girls? And is this effect different for women and girls than it is for men and boys? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the common leveler is mm -hmm. poverty. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you look at people who are poor, it, yeah. it really doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. You okay. feel the effects of society abandoning you. Oh, yes. That's quite true. But irrespective of that, we still say it affects women more, women and girls. The reason is simple. We have more of women. Majority of the world's population are being recognized as women. If you have a situation where there is war, the people who are top mostly affected are women and girls. Also, because we in are already coming. Yes, in war. Because this set of people face two types of trouble. Right. Not only are they, you know, affected. Sometimes they also face they're the problem of rape. Right. They're displaced rape, and then displaced, they're sexually, the sexual violence assaulted, said, right. and then most times they run with their children at hand. Right. That's what we've seen in most of the IDP camps that we've, you know, visited in the past. And then for me, I say this all the time. We are coming from a long stretch of a patriarchal nature where we already know that those who have the resources, those who have the power are more of the men. Most top you know, positions you go to, you, you, the tendency is that you will meet a man there over a woman. And there was a but there are quite a lot of women in the Nigerian government. Except, no, there are women in the Nigerian government. But when you need to... I mean, to, in very important positions. True, true. But when you also take a look at the numbers and the position that they occupy, you also see the difference. Most times, if you look at um, the government, you don't find them at the helm of affairs itself. It's either that they're assisting or something. Yeah, but, but to be a minister, though, I mean, in, in the last few years in Nigeria, women have occupied the most important ministerial positions. You've had them, I mean, we had Ngozi Okonjo Iweala there, who was Minister of Finance, coordinating Minister of the Economy. She made decisions about what affects women most, the economy. You had, I mean, right now you've got the Minister of Finance, who's also a woman. I mean, you had the Minister of Petroleum Resources, mm -hmm. you know, who is a woman, and that's where most of Nigeria's money comes from. I mean, isn't that you know, you, example one, you, of progress. You just talked about gender equality, right? Right. So I'll ask you this. In the number of women you've mentioned, you mentioned just two of those well, in top. Quite all right, there are three. And how many ministerial positions do we have normally? No, no, I, I, I don't disagree with you mm -hmm. that there needs to be some correction. No question mm -hmm. about that. Sure. In fact, the, um, the, there should be a significant percentage of the cabinet should be made up of women. But what I'm trying to gauge is the progress that's being made. The progress that is being made is you can't, you can't get, let me use this analysis, you have a position or in a ministerial committee where you have about 40 to 48 people and you have only three women there taking decisions with about, you know, 47 men. The voices of the three will be drowned in that scenario. So for us, that's not representation enough. And if you would come with the analogy of 
someone being the Minister of Finance, she can't do it alone. She also needs other no, people of course I understand who, that. who are also raising right. issues. Nevertheless, and also demanding... in that cabinet mm -hmm. meeting, the issue is not always ranged or, or sort of decided on a gender basis. Oh my God, I'm a woman, he's a man. I mean, of they're course. talking about issues mm -hmm. that affect everyone in Nigeria. So, so they don't often break it down in terms of gender. You see, you see what I mean? That's what we are saying. We are saying the same thing, but just in different right. terms. And I'm saying, you've made a good point, but I'm saying that's not enough. We right, can do okay. better. We can do better. For example, when we also talk about health care, you talked about transportation, how women are disproportionately affected. Mm. And I keep saying, it's only a woman who is in such a position that understands the depths that a woman will go through if she needs to assess public health you know, care services. And then the road is not good. Because the tendency is that you have a man who is doing other things and has his own issue as hard. Mm. But the woman will take care of the children. When she goes to the health care, she's the one demanding for this. If you now talk about assessing you know services we are, we've also found out from you know our engagements that women tend not to have the resources to be able to pay bribes mm. so when they go in for services that they feel they should get they are asked to pay something extra for it because of their poor condition they do not have this money to pay that's not all they also do not even know that they should report most times because of the level of you know literacy or illiteracy whatever it is the level of education they have could be poor so they don't even know that if i'm going here and i'm asked to pay i should be able to demand for it as my right and then shout out mm. so for us at um, you know under the gender and accountability project we are looking at all these issues as they affect women and why we are not hearing their voices and we are telling them you have the right to come out for representation anybody who is stopping you it's also part of correction and you should demand for it you also have the right to demand for a service that you're entitled to mm. and then when you are asked to pay extra or when you're being extorted you have the duty to demand for it and we have voices who will help. She mentioned um, Women Radio. What Women Radio has been doing is to talk about issues that affect women in particular. And then they've been trying to get women to speak up on these issues. So now you hear things like, oh, I didn't know that this was an issue. I just thought that it was normal. But now we are drawing people's attention to the way that yeah, That's a very important thing. We've got about a minute to go. When we come back, we'll come back to you again. Um, where are we now with the issue of women, women's rights in Nigeria, broadly speaking? Broadly speaking, women's rights are still not, um, women are still not so aware of their rights. And is it worse be. in a part of Nigeria than other parts? Yes, it's worse in some areas, like the, mostly in the core northern areas where women culturally have been marginalized. Okay. And let me come to you, Zainabs, from your point of view. Um, if you can find ways of detecting and highlighting the amount of corruption that's going on in Nigeria, um, that would really help to argue the case about the effect that it's having on women on girls and girls, wouldn't it? Do. Yeah. And um, recently a survey was done, um, carried out, um, sampling over 33,000 um, respondents across Nigeria by the uh, National Bureau of Statistics mm. and um, UNODC. And it discovered that women are actually less corrupt than men. And, um, well, that's an interesting point. Yes. Because, um, I mean, we deal in scientific facts. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to get to that, get back to that in, minute, in a minute. But just, just in terms of measuring corruption, um, which, of course, is one of the things you're talking about. You can see um, which means of combating corruption are more or less effective. Because, I mean, ultimately, that's what you want. You want to combat corruption, mm -hmm. don't you? Is it community participation? Is it intensive audits? Is it doubling the salaries of police officers? I mean, once you can measure it, you can then look at interventions um, and see how they translate into fighting corruption. Giving a level playing ground for both men and mm. women would actually go a long way in fighting corruption. Because as it, as it is... Um, and that's based on the research you've done, yes, right? Yes, because women are more marginalized right. and um, they suffer the brunt of corruption more. And given that they are less in public offices compared to the men, 
they also don't have a say over a lot yeah, of that's issues. A good, that's a good, and they don't have as many opportunities to actually men. be and this corrupt. Is from so, so from yeah. that point of view, yeah. I mean, we don't really have evidence that would indict them for corruption. But that doesn't mean that potentially they're not going to be corrupt. Because, I mean, we've had lots of women mm -hmm. who've had to be... In fact, there's one particular woman, I'm not going to mention her name, well, is who, who is being looked for all over the world at the moment from Nigeria. And how many men? Good point. <laughs> but given that, for example, I, I'm just trying to understand mm. this because what you're doing is important, not yeah. just for women and girls, but for mm. corruption as a whole. Yeah. I mean, given that legal enforcement is so different across mm -hmm. the world, um, I'm just wondering if people bring different values mm -hmm. to corruption transactions. For instance, if you're stopped by a traffic police officer mm -hmm. in the UK or the US and you're asked to pay a fine, you wouldn't dream of slipping them a $50 bill. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you would simply, because you know the consequences mm -hmm. would not be a happy one for mm -hmm. you. I mean, you wouldn't dare do that. But, you know, take yourself to Nigeria, take the same person to Nigeria and pose the same question and you wouldn't think of not paying a bribe because that is the dominant perception in this country. So people bring different values to mm -hmm. these sorts of transactions. And you'll see someone who's actually in the UK mm -hmm. will not do it, but they'll come to Nigeria and do it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm just wondering how much that creates a, quag I mean, a problem for, for people like yourself and the fight against corruption that you're putting forth. So you see, in the course of what we've been doing, we've also had the opportunity to engage. So for example, we en engage with critical stakeholders, EFCC, we've engaged with ICPC, mm. you know, civil defense, the people who should be normally the duty bearers ensuring that sanctions are being laid out. And you know, initially it was like, we've been trying, that was the response we got, we've been trying, but there are issues at hand. And we said, we cannot be doing it on this part without the other part playing its role very well. It's really important because we also understand the issues, like you said, about morals and values in Nigeria. And what we brought to our engagement most times is to tell even the women and the men who we engage that all of this starts from the home front. Mm. So for example, before the child gets into the society, the child would have portrayed one, two, three, you know, of these symptoms at home. What are you doing as a parent mm. or a caregiver to, you know, nip it at the board? So we understand what you said, and we are not just, you know, handling it at the government agency. What yeah. we've been doing, it's more like an inter intertwined, you know, Well, you, you have engagement. a very good point there, because th there, are, there is evidence mm -hmm. that this thing can actually, that there's particular countries and particular cultures mm -hmm. that have a greater tendency to corruption. For example, there was a survey done in New York, and it probably won't surprise you mm -hmm. to know that diplomats who have diplomatic immunity, mm -hmm. um, and they, they often get a lot of, tra do a lot, you know, traffic offenses, but nobody can do anything to them because mm -hmm. they have diplomatic immunity. But whereas most traffic offenses in New York, the people who clogged up the most were Nigerian <laughs> diplomats. The Swedes, for example, people from mm -hmm. Sweden who didn't have to, I mean, they could have violated the rules or whatever, without legal consequences, mm -hmm. they simply did not accumulate a single unpaid fine. And that came from looking at the records of police mm -hmm. back to about 10 years. We've got about a minute, so you've got the last word. Okay. Um, it's a general phenomenon to actually um, curtail the excesses of, of uh, children from home. And if this is not done at the right time and they're modeling the good behaviors mm. from home, it uh, extends to the society, so the, the larger society. Is that part of it, the educational system it, in Nigeria and all of that, that behavior yeah, the engagement, you know, has to change? Yes, behavioral change is a basic um, aspect of our sensitization and mobilization activities. We engage with um, grassroots mm. women who are the, at the home front in um, trying to see that they step up, they are also accountable for right. 
bringing so you're doing it on it. several levels. Several the home levels. fronts, the yeah. government fronts, Communist the Communist institutions Communist. that are yeah. supposed to keep an eye on these yes. things. Well, I, I hope it goes well and keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Zainab, Abdul, Rashid and of course Lois Chinedu, thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.